On our journey to ascend the throne, we have an abundance of choice when it comes to how we wish to rebuild the crumbling world around us. We have the power to implement a number of new orders that will replace the crumbling rule of Marika and the Erd Tree. We can choose to mend the Elden Ring, alter it, or replace it with something completely new. However, we are not the only ones who are seeking to rebuild the world, for the Outer Gods and their chosen champions vie with us for control of this world. Moog and his formless mother seek to supplant Marika with an Order of Blood and a God of Blood in the form of Mikola. And yet as dangerous as Moog is, there is something eating away at the very lands themselves, an unstoppable, plague-like substance known as the Scarlet Rot. Beguiled by its crimson power, there are those who have foreseen the Order of Rot, a cycle of death and rebirth, physically represented by the potent Aeonian Bloom and the pests that are born from it. There is almost nothing as powerful in the lands between as the corrosive and corrupting power of the Rot. Even the mightiest of the demigods fell victim to its power, and the most fearsome Empyrean of them all has dedicated his life to repelling its power. In our era, we find that this order is unwillingly championed by Melania, who has spent her entire life trying to deny the goddess of rot within her. Yet the inevitability of her fate becomes tragically clear, as Melania is pushed to the limit by conflict and she ultimately loses herself to the Scarlet Rot, while those who worship her do everything in their power to prepare for her ascension. Yet the root of the Scarlet Rot has a far more expansive history, making it clear that Melania is only the latest vessel in a play for power by an exceptionally powerful and patient outer god. So grab your hazmat suits and join me as we dive right into the depths of the Scarlet Rot and Melania, the goddess of rot. I think that before we get into the video proper, it would be worthwhile to understand what the adherents of Scarlet Rot expect to achieve, as well as getting an understanding of the Rot itself. Gowrie, an important figure in all of this, who we will return to later, says the following regarding the foreseen Order of Rot. Since Melania fought Radan, and the great scarlet flower blossomed in Aeonia, I have dedicated myself to her, and to the resplendence of the Order of Rot. The cycle of decay and rebirth. So the Scarlet Rot, to those who venerate it, is a vehicle for a cycle of decay and rebirth. Much like Nurgle from Warhammer, disease brings death, but from the carcass of the dead comes new life, and so the cycle continues. As you will see as we go through the video, a lot of the ideas associated with the Scarlet Rot, such as butterflies, fungus, and blooming flowers, are symbolic of these ideas of rebirth and decay. The death bringing aspect of the Scarlet Rot is especially clear when we see the wasting properties of the Rot in game. The Rot Pot item aptly describes the effects of this as it reads, The Rot bubbles up from the swamp of Aeonia and eats away at life like a vicious plague. It is a plague that eats away at life and flesh as we see from Melania and Millicent, both infection vectors, they have lost their limbs which have been consumed by the Scarlet Rot, and when we are ourselves infected with it, we are devoured until we die. We can also see how the infection can devour someone else's brain, corroding their organs from the inside out until they are little more than a rabid beast. Such is the fate of both Radan and Ezekiel's both of whom have their minds wasted by the rot that writhes within them. This is not a natural disease, it is an aspect of the cosmic being known as the Outer God of Rot, and as such it cannot be easily cured or repelled as a regular plague. Gary comments on the fact that the gods could not even stop it, for he says, The rotting sickness that afflicts Millicent has no cure. When the Erd Tree flourished, even the demigods could not stave off its effects, despite their nigh godhood. The only things that appear to have had any forestalling effect on it 
is fire and Mikola's unalloyed gold. And even then, fire only seems to have limited utility, as unless the infected are completely burned away, they can still be animated by the living plague, as seen by the plague zombies who still animate even when they're on fire and most of their bodies have been rotted away. I think we can see how unnatural this infection is by looking at the fact it can affect essentially every form of life imaginable. Dragons, halig trees, and even crystallians, inhuman life forms that don't even have fleshy bodies, and yet they can still become riddled with the scarlet rot. In fact, it even appears as some that have been infected, crystallians that is, have come to the halig tree for whatever reason, as if they are being made to serve Melania, the goddess of rot, as if the scarlet of rot somehow controls even these unusual life forms. And then there is the other facet of the cycle of rot, the rebirth half, i.e. the rebirth that happens in the wake of all of this death. This aspect is fittingly represented by the various fungi and mushrooms we see in areas afflicted by the scarlet rot. Mushrooms themselves are forms of life that grow out of decay, and so we can see in truth what Gary purports, new life is springing from that which has been broken down by the scarlet rot. With the death that it brings, so does it bring new life. Even Mikla's revered halig tree was no match for the overwhelming influence of the rot. With Melania returned from her conflicts, she has brought the wasting sickness itself to the tree. In my Mikla lore video, I argued that the presence of an Erdtree avatar at Ephel implies that the Halig tree itself is a sapling offshoot of the Erdtree, and I take this from the description of the staff of the avatar, the weapons wielded by the avatars, and it reads the following. The avatars, emerging in the wake of the Elden Ring shattering, were determined to protect the withering Erdtree's offspring. Therefore, why else would this avatar be here? if not to defend the Halig Tree, leading us to conclude it is an offshoot of the Erd Tree. So the very fact that the Scarlet Rot has infested not only this avatar, but this offshoot of the Erd Tree itself, is a testament to the potent and devastating nature of the Scarlet Rot. The Rot has hollowed out the Halig Tree and taken over its carcass completely. The Scarlet Rot mushrooms are growing from its bark and boughs and literal waterfalls of the Scarlet Rot itself flow through the hollowed out centre of the halig tree itself, showing how overrun and saturated the tree is with the scarlet rot. Indeed, by the time we get to the tree, it is barely a husk for the scarlet rot, a far cry from the idealised tree that we see represented in the symbolism of Mikola's people and warriors. Aside from fungi, there are other examples of life that appear to form in the scarlet rot's wake, such as the pests and the giant ant, the latter of which is implied to be connected to the rot through the ant spur rapier, and this would explain why they infest the underground areas and the halig tree, as these are areas both connected to an infection of scarlet rot. And whether they are born from the rot or just thrive in it is up for debate. The giant ants are not the only misproportioned and giant animals that we see surviving in areas with scarlet rot, and we will return to that when we get to Caelid shortly. But suffice it to say, whilst others die in the wake of the Scarlet Rot, clearly there are some life forms that benefit from the decay that it brings. Of course, the pests themselves are the most connected to the rot, especially since they are referred to as the kindred of rot, suggesting they are themselves actually creatures of the rot rather than creatures that just survive in the rot. Interestingly, however, these pests were not born of the Lake of Rot, nor the Outer God of Rot directly, but they seem to be connected to Melania more specifically. As such, they are often referred to as the Children of the Goddess, such as in the Kindred of Rot's Ashes, and specifically the Pest's Glaive, which is where it is stated they come from the Aeonian Swamp directly, and its description reads as follows. Glaive made from a hard, sharpened shell, wielded by the pests who emerged from the Swamp of Aeonia. So while the Scarlet Rot is a vicious and cleansing form of death, new life springs eternal from the decaying remains of the old. One needs only look at the real world to see that this is a reality of life. In the corpse of any decaying animal, one will find new life incubating, 
like maggots, as well as it providing great sustenance for other larval insects. I would suggest that these pests are evocative of this type of carrion life, an insectoid form that flourishes in the decaying remains of other life, especially given their appearance, which to me is something between a cockroach, a silverfish, and a centipede. Yet these creatures are not completely mindless beasts, as we learn from the item description again of the pest glaives, which reads as follows. Though men might recognise the keen intellect of the pests, evidenced by this skier's uncanny design, it will never be understood by them. Indeed, we see them participating in behaviour only exhibited by sentient life, such as guarding Millicent, who they see as a holy vessel for the Scarlet Rot. They of course are wielding weapons that they have themselves constructed, and they worship, such as the worshipping we see of the holy relic of the Scorpion Stinger in the Grand Cloister, and at the cult site within Celia Crystal Cave. And in addition, we see them serving beside peacefully their allies, such as the warriors at the Halig Tree, showing that they do have some sort of semblance of consciousness, that they don't just mindlessly attack everyone around them. Regardless, I see them as the beings that are most at peace and most connected to the Scarlet Rot. We know from the description of the pest threads incantation that these pale pests crawl through the lands afflicted by scarlet rot. It does not affect their bodies and in fact they thrive in it, whereas other life is completely devoured by it. They are intimately linked to the scarlet rot and Melania, goddess of rot herself. They are the true children of the rot. One of the constant indicators of the rot's presence that we see in game is of course butterflies, i.e. we see them in the depths of the rotten halig tree, and of course in the Aeonian swamp there are butterflies aplenty. The imagery here is once again pretty clear. Butterflies are symbolic for rebirth, again in keeping with what the scarlet rot represents, a cycle of transformative life. A piece of imagery that is bluntly hammered home with Melania's transformation, into a goddess of raw, when she emerges from a cocoon as a butterfly-esque being with butterfly wings made of butterflies. So that being said, yes, it looks like the Aeonian butterflies seem to be part of Melania herself, for their description reads, according to myth, these butterflies were once the wings of the goddess of raw herself. And indeed, as mentioned, when Melania does transform into the goddess of raw, her wings do appear to be made of lots of these butterflies pressed together. Now, you'll realise that this poses a difficult lore quandary, and one that I will seek to explain in the course of this video. The problem is, is that most people assume that in her fight with us, this is the only time she has transformed into the Goddess of Rot. Yet, this would not make sense, because given these butterflies exist already before we force Melania to transform, it means she must have already transformed before so that these butterflies could break off and infest the lands between. I would therefore suggest that each time she blooms, a facet of her god form comes into being as much as it does with her fight with us. I ultimately believe that her transformation during our battle is actually only the second bloom rather than the final third bloom that most people seem to believe. I will explain this in depth and give you the answer you seek when we revisit Melania in the Goddess of Rot chapter of this video but more on that later. The Aeonian Swamp is a great example of what one would expect from the Age of Rot. The Aeonian Bloom that bloomed during the battle between Melania and Radan has literally grown to wrap its tendrils through all of Caelid, spreading death and disease, but also new forms of life growing from that death. This is the vision of the world that the Servants of Rot would have brought about, a world of constant death and rebirth. It is an ideal encapsulized well by the description of poison armament, and it reads as follows. Those who dwell within poison know rot all too well, the death that begets life that comes to all equally. That is to say, it is the cycle of rebirth put into practice. Death begets life, and death comes to all equally. This is the promise and purpose of the Scarlet Rot. While Caelid to our eyes, and to the eyes of those who serve the Red Mane, may look like a realm of utter hell and torment, one cannot deny that from the death is an abundance of new life that is growing. 
Yet the scarlet rot is not a natural phenomena. There is a hand behind the power of this rot. An outer god that once had a physical presence within these lands, inspiring the so-called lords of rot to champion its cause long ago, long before millennia. So I would like to turn to the history of the scarlet rot that predates even millennia's birth. The Outer God of Rot is directly mentioned in the item of the Blue Dancer charm, and it reads as follows. The Dancer in Blue represents a fairy who in legend bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was Rot itself. We will of course return to the blind swordsman later, but an important aspect to remember for now is the outer god of rot is explicitly mentioned so we know of their existence, as well as them being termed ancient, and again I would suggest that most of the events we're going to talk about in this chapter happened a long time before the current events of the game. This outer god is also then mentioned in the Scorpion Stinger's item description, an item we know relates to this being due to its location deep within the Lake of Rot and surrounded by the Kindred of Rot. It is also a weapon that inflicts Scarlet Rot itself. And so with that association in mind, let's read the description. Dagger fashioned from a great scorpion's tail, glistening with Scarlet Rot. A ceremonial tool used by heretics, crafted from the relic of a sealed outer god. This stinger knife was fashioned from a large scorpion, Simultaneously, this is described as a relic of an outer god, implying that this great scorpion and the outer god are one and the same, that the outer god of rot once had a physical form, or an aspect of him did have a physical form, that took the shape of a great scorpion, and given scorpions association with venom, as well as being heavily associated with death imagery, it makes sense that the outer god of rot would have this as their physical form. But the physical presence of the scorpion stinger and the scorpion that it came from seems to go against what we see as normal for these outer gods. It has an implied physical form. If this relic is of the outer god, then it implies the stinger is made from the remains of a physical form, much as the bastard stars are crafted from the remains of Astel and it is also termed a relic. This relic is now of course a holy medium for the pests who worship it, no doubt as an aspect of their ultimate creator, deep within the Grand Cloister. This is once again an ancient ruin built by the same people who built the palace of Ul and Ald, something I talk about in detail on my Nox and Nocron video, and I would highly recommend you check that out if you want more information. But it has now been completely engulfed, by the Lake of Rot, a pure scarlet rot lake that exists beneath the surface of the lands between. Melania is responsible for the Scarlet Aeonia in Caelid, but the Lake of Rot seems to have zero ties with her, as it is nowhere near any of the sites where she has bloomed or visited, and it also seems far more advanced as if it is a more advanced progression of Scarlet Rot, as if it has been around for a long time. What follows is my speculation, but I would suggest that the Lake of Rot is an earlier manifestation of the Scarlet Rot than the Swamp of Ionia, no doubt just stated by the presence of this Scorpion Outer God itself, given we find the relic in the same area. And I also believe that due to another item we find in the area, a community or even a civilization propped up around the Lake of Rot, entranced by its power and would serve as the first servants of Rot, for in this area we also find the Mushroom Crown item, and the description of the item reads as follows. Mushrooms found growing all over the body. These overgrown mushrooms form a towering headpiece. Long ago, great lords served the Scarlet Rot. Perhaps such fungal bodies served as their crowns. This, for me, is one of those item descriptions that just has massive implications for the game's lore as a whole. So it does say what I just suggested. There is a civilization of people who worshipped and served the rot, and it happened long ago. These people had hierarchy and numbers enough to give rise to great lords who wore these mushroom crowns as a symbol of their allegiance. 
One can't help but imagine what this community would have been like. People infected by the mushrooms, much like the servants of rot we see today, led by these great lords of rot, all in the presence of their scorpion god. Of course, as I mentioned in the prior chapter, this rot empire would probably not have had kindred of rot with them, as we see all the lore pointing to the fact that the kindred of rot would be born in the Caled Swamp specifically and be the children of Melania specifically. Their presence here now can easily be explained away by the fact that they are intimately connected to the rot, and so would of course be drawn here by the presence of the lake and the relic beyond. To me the location of the Mushroom Crown, the Storpian Stinger, and this massive body of rot itself suggests to me that this was the centre of an old rot kingdom and lords. When it comes to a timeline, I do see this as taking place quite a bit before the events of game and before Melania was probably born. In the Mushroom Crown, we see it's referred to as happening long ago. And secondly, the Outer God of Rot is called Ancient. Indeed, reinforcing the idea that the Scarlet Rot predates Melania's involvement is in the lore found in the item description of the Antspur Rapier, and it reads as follows. Scarlet Rot is an old legend, of which Marley Murray of the Shaded Castle was a private believer. It is an old legend. The events in Eonia are far more recent, and to me it implies that the Scarlet Rot has long predated Melania, and that this Lake of Rot and the Lords of Rot that came before are a long time past. So bringing this all together, deep underground we see that there was once a presence of the Outer God of Rot physically manifested. From this would blossom what we now know as the Lake of Rot, and worshippers of this early Scarlet Rot would become great lords, leading the followers and faithful of the Scarlet Rot. And for these people it must have seemed as though the ascension of their order was inevitable, given the power of the Rot and the physical presence of this great scorpion. Alas, this was something that would soon be snatched away from them. Unfortunately for those of the rot, agents of the flowing waters were moving against them. From the scorpion stinger item description, we learn that the outer god would become sealed, and we can learn more of this event if we reread the blue dancer charm, which again reads as follows. The dancer in blue represents a fairy, who in legend bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was wrought itself. So let's unpack this one piece at a time. Firstly we see it was the swordsman of the flowing blade who would defeat the outer god, sealing them away, which I take to mean that he removed the outer god's physical form, the scorpion one, from the mortal plane, leaving behind only the stinger relic. Significantly, the swordsman also seems to be the same warrior who would go on to be Melania's mentor, as we learn from the prosthesis heirloom, but we will return to that subject in more detail later. However, we can see this warrior's technique in Melania's own style, most clearly her waterfowl dance. What is interesting is that this dancer's technique, a flowing technique, seems to have some sort of power over the rot, as well as a connection to flowing waters. We can learn more of this from the blue cloth set, the set for the warrior starting class, but it also seems to refer to the warrior of the flowing blade, due to the language used and the colour blue, and the description reads as follows. The blue colour of its fabric symbolises brisk waters, as fluid and flowing as the sword in hand of its wearer. Just as still waters turn foul, stagnation leads to decay. Warriors must remain ever drifting. So blue is representative of flowing waters, a colour used in reference to the fairy as we saw by the blue dancer charm, and the warrior of the flowing blade. Flowing sword movements are therefore evocative of fresh moving waters, in opposition to stagnant still water, and in turn decay. The idea of movement being related to purity and stillness being related to stagnation is nothing new in From Software games, and the purity of water or the stagnation of it plays a massive role in Sekiro's storyline. This concept will also be grasped more quickly by those who are familiar with Japanese culture, but in short, in Shintoism, 
the ever-continuing cycle of life is represented as flowing water. Stagnation of water is seen as a corruption of this natural flow. This is a grossly oversimplified explanation, but you get the gist. So from this, we get the idea that flowing movements and blue, symbolising flowing water, is an important opposing force of the scarlet stagnant rot, and it has some power over it. It now makes sense that this warrior was able to ward away and defeat the outer god of decay of stagnation by using the purifying techniques of his flowing blade. This clearly means that the fairy mentioned in the Blue Dancer charm who gives this power to the blind swordsman must also be connected to flowing water and is in opposition to the power of decay and stagnation found in the Scarlet Rot. But who is this fairy, as they are never mentioned again in any other in-game lore? Well thanks to a really perceptive Reddit user called Nameless Singer, we may well have an answer, and I would highly recommend you check out this thoughtful post, which I will link below. In this Reddit post on this very subject, they suggest that the fairy is none other than an embodiment of Shifra River itself. This already fits in with the flowing water themes we've picked up on, but more importantly, the reason they link this is because Shifra is Gaelic for fairy. Nameless Singer goes into further detail about how Ainsil could also be linked to fairies as well, giving this a full circle picture. So I would highly recommend you read that post in full, and again I commend Nameless Singer for making this important connection. This does tie up to me and makes perfect sense when I read it, because in various European folklore, especially in Celtic mythology, fairies are often seen as metaphysically tied to the water, sometimes the water folk. And so I do believe that it was Shifra River itself that gave the dancer his flowing techniques that drove away the outer god of rot, the flowing natural water versus the stagnant decaying rot. With the outer god sealed and the rot forestalled for now, the blind swordsman would keep his vigilance until the rot would surface again, which it would, and this time in the form of Melania. Melania's birth should have been an auspicious birth, due to the nature of her and her twins' births, as described by Melania's great rune, which states the fact that her rune should have been the most sacred of all, due to her unique parentage. The special nature of this birth is further elaborated on by the remembrance of the rock goddess, which reads as follows. Mekala and Melania are both the children of a single god, as such, they are both Empyreans, but suffered afflictions from birth. One was cursed with eternal childhood, and the other harboured rot within. So in my Mikla video, I extensively went over the semantics of this remembrance in regards to their birth, even including a Japanese translation of this text by Last Protagonist, which I will show again on the screen, and again thanks to Last Protagonist, and I would recommend that you check out their really insightful content on their YouTube channel, which I will link below. Long story short, what we concluded in that video is that these children were born of a single god, a single bodied being, the Marika and Radigan Rebus, who were at this point a single being. This single being essentially mated with itself to produce these children, an extraordinary event that would lead to the birth of these incredible twins. And the semantics used in the Remembrance of Rot that says, as such, they are both Empyreans, clearly implies that this birth, their nature of their birth from a single being, is the reason why they became Empyreans. And we know from Rani's dialogue that it is the two fingers who choose who become Empyrean, meaning that because of their birth, the two fingers realised how special these children were and chose them to be Empyrean. So we can conclude that the two fingers saw how special these children would be and elected them as potential replacement gods. And I think the importance and celebrated nature of these twins is well represented by a statue found in Halig Tree Town, which appears to show Marika cradling her two special children. Now the importance of her birth and what it has to do with her relationship to Scarlet Rot is further elaborated on by Gowrie who says the following of Melania's birth and upbringing. She was born an Empyrean carrying the Scarlet Rod, 
An Empyrean is no mere demigod. In the age of the Elden Ring and Queen Manica, the precious Empyrean was born, a new god, to forge a new order. Since millennia fought Radan, and the great scarlet flower blossomed in Aeonia, I have dedicated myself to her, and to the resplendence of the order of rot, the cycle of decay and rebirth. So as already stated by Melania's Remembrance, Gary confirms that from the moment she was born, Melania already carried the Scarlet Rot within her, meaning that at some point between conception and her birth, the Outer God of Rot chose her to be its vessel. The fact that she is chosen as a vessel by the Outer God of Rot makes perfect sense. Given the Outer God of Rot's defeat at the Swordsman of the Flowing Blade, this outer god would need a god or a vessel to rule on its behalf, much like Marika does for the Greater Well currently, and the outer god of Rot no doubt saw the potential in these twins. Being the vessel for such a potent substance was clearly a massive burden. We can see the effect of Rot upon Melania's very body. She is covered in scars, scaled skin, and has even lost limbs to the advancing Rot. This is why I find Melania to be one of the most extraordinary, heroic, and tragic figures in all of Elden Ring. She suffers so much right from birth, and yet still manages to rise as one of the most powerful beings in an age, whilst bravely containing the rot within herself. And Melania's courage is something that transcends the ordinary. We can see that she is so infused with the Scarlet Rot, that even her great rune becomes afflicted by it and we can see this from the actual image itself and the description of the Great Rune. However, her Great Rune also tells us more about her character, for it reads, The blessing of this half-rotted rune reduces the healing power of Flask of Crimson Tears, and yet, due to the infusion of Melania's spirit of resistance, attacks made immediately after receiving damage will partially recover HP. So Melania's ability during her fight with us to recover health from attacking is actually the product of her own courage, her courageous resistance against the life-sapping rot. This is so powerful that it actually manifests itself as an actual power through her great rune. The one joy she would find within her life was the pride that she felt in her skill with a blade. For her brother, it would become a fixation for most of Mikla's life to find a cure for his beloved sister's plight. And at this point, I would of course recommend you watch my lore video on Mikla, as it goes into far more detail on these events, and in a way is a companion piece to this one. But anyway, Mikla first looked for answers within the tenets of the Golden Order, but in time Mikla determined that the answer lay not with his father's order, nor with the Greater Will. Something we learn from Radigan's Rings of Light, which reads, one of the incantations of the Golden Order Fundamentalists, a gift of gratitude to the young Mikola from his father, Radigan. And yet, the young Mikola abandoned fundamentalism, for it could do nothing to treat Melania's accursed rot. This was the beginning of unalloyed gold. And so he would establish his own order of unalloyed gold with his Halig Tree. This was a movement dedicated to eradicating the meddling influence of the Outer Gods, but of course his primary focus would be on pushing out the Scarlet Rot from his sister Melania. In the course of his work, Mikola would develop his Unalloyed Gold, a purified material that has the power to repel Outer Gods, a fact which is confirmed by the item description of the needle itself, which reads, An intricately crafted needle of Unalloyed Gold snapped in half a ritual implement crafted to ward away the meddling of outer gods. It is thought capable of forestalling the incurable rotting sickness. Sage Gowrie has designs for this needle. This of course isn't capable of curing the scarlet rot completely, especially for those who act as its vessel, such as Melania and her offshoot Valkyries, but it is effective in holding back its advances and effects. We of course see the power of the unalloyed gold on Millicent first hand, as when we first meet her she is barely able to function as the rot eats away at her insides. 
However, when she inserts the unalloyed gold needle into her flesh, we can see that she is given immediate relief from its advances, and can function as well as any normal human. How Mikla has the understanding to actually be able to do this is in part explained by Gary himself, who says the following. The work of a true artisan, a meticulous, bold craftsman who grasps the essence of life. Mikla understands the essence of life and how it can be affected by the powers of the outer gods. As discussed in the opening chapter, the scarlet rot is no ordinary disease as we would understand it, and it cannot be treated in a medicinal way. It is the essence of an outer god, and so by using the unalloyed gold as a tinfoil that blocks the outer god's influence, one is able to forestall its corroding effects. At least that is my interpretation of it. It is severing or halting the connection of the outer god onto the scarlet rot. Like Millicent, Melania was clearly treated with the unalloyed gold to allow her to live a more normal life without being eaten away by the pain completely. We see proof of this in her prosthesis and armour, the item descriptions for each informing us that these two are made from the unalloyed gold, so not only serving as armour, but as medicinal aids. As I will discuss at a number of points in this video, I do also believe that the unalloyed gold needle that we present to Millicent was actually once Melania's, and was the main object that held back the power of her scarlet bloom. This is all of course to buy Melania more time while Mikola searches for a permanent solution as this is of course not permanent. I believe that Mikola's hunt for a greater cure is hinted at in the item description found within Melania's armour as it reads the following. Melania awaited Mikola at the foot of the husk. My brother will keep his promise. He possesses the wisdom the allure of a god, he is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. So here we see mention of a promise, and to me it is quite clearly implied that Mikola's promise is to search for a true and complete cure of her sickness, most likely why he embedded himself in the Halig Tree, again something I speculate on in my Mikola video. But sadly it is a promise he is unable to keep, due to the interference of Moog. But at the very least, the unalloyed gold needle helped keep the scarlet blooms held back and therefore halted her transformation into a goddess of rock proper. That is of course until she chose to remove it, but again we'll get to that soon. What I think all of this highlights is the incredible bond shared by the two twins. In Elden Ring, twins are often used as a sort of yin and yang, two opposites in balance, much as Moog and Morgoat. Mikla is purity and Melania is decay, and in cut content, in fact, Mikla was once meant to represent abundance in balance to Melania's decay, and I would again refer you to the Garden of Eyes video on this subject. Yet the opposing nature of these two siblings just seems to bring them closer together, and we see this is an incredible bond. Their devotion to one another is celebrated throughout the Halig Tree in the form of these rather moving statues of them both embracing one another. They were both born with afflictions, and they came together to lift each other up. Mikla would use his fearsome intellect to help cure Melania's sickness and give her some temporary relief, and Melania would repay his devotion by compensating for his physical frailty and becoming his blade. And actually talking about this relationship is almost bringing a tear to the eye. It's one of the more moving stories in the game in my opinion, these two broken and afflicted children, doomed from birth, and yet that did not stop them from loving each other and supporting each other the best way that they could. Yet it would not only be Mikla who would watch out for Melania, there was clearly another important influence in her early life, and we now return to the swordsman of the flowing blade. The prothesis wearer's heirloom talisman tells us about this relationship, as it reads the following. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered her mentor and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. So I think that we can clearly determine that this meeting was not a coincidence. Rather, the flowing swordsman once again finds himself tracking down the source of scarlet rot. In this case, it happens to be a young girl. And so he becomes her mentor, teaching her his combat techniques 
and the image of the talisman itself seems to show them both in sparring gear, which is a nice detail, I think. We already know that the blind swordsman was a warrior of exceptional and unique skill, and this is reinforced by the curved sword talisman, which reads as follows. It is said that a blind swordsman was the originator of this technique, the art of allowing one's opponent to strike, so to leave them vulnerable to a well-timed reply. This would explain why Melania would go on to be the greatest swordsman of all the demigods, having been trained from birth by a superlative swordsman. Indeed, the wings mentioned in the prosthesis wearer heirloom are meant to symbolise her combat prowess, a fact we have ratified by the winged sword insignia, which reads the following. The wings symbolise Melania and her undefeated prowess, though she never knew relief from the accursed rot she was born into. Her blade was forever beautiful and relentless. Yet while clearly symbolic of her power, the wings I mean, I also believe that in the heat of combat people may have actually caught glimpses of her true winged form, especially if we look at the description of the Hand of Melania, her sword, and it reads as follows. Melania's war prosthesis symbolised her victories. Some claimed to have seen wings when the weapon was raised aloft, wings of fierce determination that have never known defeat. So I believe that Melania's winged goddess form is always close to the surface, and incidentally these wings also explain the winged symbolism associated with Melania, such as the wings on her helmet and those of the helmets of her clean wrought knights. These wings are a symbol of her power, both figuratively and literally. The unmatched swordmanship of Melania would lead to her becoming a well-renowned and feared hero. Exploits like making Godric the Golden beg for his life would only increase her fame. Her fame and regard as a warrior would give her a measure of pride and self-worth, something to focus on rather than letting the rot eat her away, and it gives her a reason not to give in to the rot. The blind swordsman tutelage, to my mind, is also more than just making Melania a skilled swordsman. It was also about teaching her the rot warding techniques of the flowing blade. As already mentioned, Melania's style and technique is representative of the blind swordsman's style, the water flowing style. It is almost that he believed that by teaching her his rot warding techniques of the flowing blade, that this would help contain the rot within her. This is of course my speculation, but I can't see any other reason why the blind swordsman would involve himself in her life and why he would teach her these techniques. Regardless, thanks to Mikola's treatments and her focus on becoming a warrior, she was able to have some semblance of a normal life and a noble life by becoming Mikola's blade as he began his new movement at the Halig Tree. Yet the Scarlet Rot would have its due and it would find a new opportunity as conflict and chaos broke across the lands in the event known as the Shattering. When the Elden Ring was broken by Marika, it would eventually trigger the event called the Shattering, a brutal all-out war where the demigods claimed the shards of the Elden Ring and battled each other for ultimate control. Despite Melania's loyalty to her brother, she too appears to have thrown her hat into the ring, and according to the story trailer for Elden Ring, it was she and Radan who were the last two contenders standing, the two mightiest remaining. We know from a sword monument that she would also class, albeit briefly, with Godric the Golden, who she would humble. She would lead her personal warriors, the Cleanrod Knights, to invade Caelid, and these knights were remarkably brave, as we learn from their sets which reads, The Cleanrod Knights vowed to fight alongside Melania, despite the inevitable, if gradual, putrefaction of their flesh. Their acceptance of their fate made these battles the fiercest of all. So these warriors are truly remarkable and also completely terrifying. They choose to fight by Melania's side, despite the fact they are being rotted away and it would mean their slow, agonising death. We can even see from the way they stand and the way they walk, it is as if they are being rotten away from the inside. The description of their armour also seems to imply that the inevitability of their death makes them more fierce in battle. And this makes sense, because someone who feels that they have nothing to lose makes them all the more dangerous, and as we can see from the armour description, 
up until the battle with Redan, they had an undefeated campaign, meaning no one won against these warriors. Indeed we know that Melania's warriors must have pushed the Redmain forces to the brink, given the Clean Rot Knights were able to reach and wound Redan himself. As we learn from the arrows that he uses, called Redan's spears, that read the following. Great arrows used by General Redan during the Festival of Combat. These are in fact the many spears with which he was stabbed by the Clean Rotten Knights. Indeed, we can see these spears in Redan's hide during the story trailer, and we can only imagine how brutal this combat was if Redan himself was able to be wounded several times by Clean Rot Knights. And indeed, we can get an idea of how brutal the fighting was during this particular conflict if we go to the War Dead Catacombs, where the ghosts of each side seem to be stuck in an echo of that war forever. And yet Melania still had Redan himself to contend with, no matter how powerful her army was. And at this point it is clear that he is at the height of his power. Given this combat is the last conscious act of Redan before he's eaten away, we can assume that the Star Scourge conflict, described by a sword memorial, has already taken place, meaning that while he's fighting Melania, he is already holding back the stars. And he's also using a further portion of his gravity power to make sure Leonard isn't being crushed. And despite these strains on his power, he still measures up to Melania and fights her to a standstill. And so it is coming against this mighty champion that causes Melania to become desperate, that she lets go of her pride and herself to unleash the Scarlet Rot just to defeat an enemy. Not being able to defeat him conventionally, Millicent states that Melania abandons all that she is just to gain victory over Redan, for when we meet her at the Halig Tree, she says the following. There is something I must return to Melania. The will that was once her own. The dignity. The sense of self. That allowed her to resist the call of the Scarlet Rot. The pride she abandoned. To meet Redan's measure. So what Millicent is actually wanting to return to Melania physically is the unalloyed gold needle that she currently has within her own flesh. She equates this needle with a sense of self and pride, as if it holds back the rot enough for a person to become their true, normal self. Indeed, prior to having the needle herself, Millicent would actually attack and invade us in the Swamp of Aeonia, something that is not usually within her nature, and you can tell this is pre-cure Millicent Due to the fact, if you look at the invader's model, it's got the unkempt hair that goes over her eyes that she has before she's healed, rather than the pulled back ponytail of cured Millicent. If we then apply this to Melania, we can determine that she removed the unalloyed gold needle from her flesh at the moment of her conflict with Rodan. She removed her sense of self and pride and gave in to total abandon. She lost her self-control just so she can unleash the power of the Scarlet Rot against this mighty opponent. And if you don't believe that this is the moment she removed this needle, then the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, in that we find this needle right in the centre of the Aeonian Swamp, right beneath the bloom itself. And by removing this needle, she was able to unleash the full power of the Scarlet Aeonian Bloom. Yet in doing so, she lost her sense of self, and now she is very much at the mercy of the encroaching rot, much as we see Millicent is when we first meet her. And indeed, the story trailer shows us this pivotal moment in real time. Melania leaps on Redan, impaling him with her blade. But at the same time, she wounds herself, allowing her own afflicted blood to run into his wound, creating a connection between the two. Then it is at this moment that Melania's flower bloomed, a nuclear-esque reaction which unleashes the Scarlet Rot across Caelid, affecting Redan himself, and it births the Great Flower, which would in time grow and devour this entire region. We can imagine at this point that Redan will have stumbled away wounded by the Scarlet Rot and the Ionian explosion, and Melania herself falls unconscious, and would need to be carried back, and we learn this from the Ashes of Clean Rot Knight Finlay, which reads as follows. Finlay was one of the few survivors of the Battle of Aeonia, who in an unimaginable act of heroism carried the slumbering demigod Melania all the way back to the Halig Tree, 
she managed the feat alone, fending off all manners of foes along the way. This event effectively will end the war between Melania and Redan. Melania is passed out, and Redan begins to suffer from the Scarlet Rot, being eaten away from the inside out. This event is also what makes Caelid what it is today. The taint of the rot has corrupted the land beyond repair, and it is no doubt a preview of what the world would be like under the Order of Rot. Despite the trailer maybe showing that it's the Wailing Dunes where this all happened, the bloom happened, we know for certain that in-game it actually happened on the site of the Swamp of Ionia. This is confirmed by one of the ghosts that overlooks the Swamp of Ionia, and I also think it's confirmed by the superb environmental storytelling in this area, as you can see exactly where the flower bloomed, at Commander O'Neill's arena. Even from this far away you can see the great boughs of the plant twisting into the sky. This is in the centre of the swamp and it is ground zero for this explosion where the very core of the old Aeonian flower is still spiralling into the sky. And it makes sense that this is where this all went down because it is the part of the land that is most saturated from the rot. It is the site from where the rot evidently spread throughout the land. And indeed we can see the branches of the flower that is spread throughout all across Caelid. It all originates and goes back to the original plant in the swamp. And if you compare it to the fresh bloom that Melania conjures when we're fighting, you can see how much it's grown and developed over the years. It branches reach all over Caelid and from each of the branches, especially in the centre of the swamp, you can see that new Aeonian buds are growing from it. And it highlights how really dangerous Melania is. Just one bloom was enough to unleash this flower that would grow and spread to effectively consume an entire region. As we learn from Finlay's Ashes, with their general incapacitated, not many clean rot knights actually survived this conflict. We can see that some made it back to the Halig Tree, some have survived in the swamp all these years, and some have fled, like to the abandoned cave where there are two clean rot knights waiting for us. However, many more of them died and now serve as carrion for the bestial Redan to feast upon. Yet for the Red Main warriors, a new war was about to begin. One against the land itself. We learn of the Red Main's struggle to contain the rot from their night set, which reads as follows. When they were driven to defeat by Melania's Scarlet Rot, the Red Main knights burned the crest on their left breast of their armour to indicate their resolve. Alas, dear home, I shan't see you again, for our duty is to remain here, a bulwark against the blight. And I think this is a nice bit of storytelling that is reinforced by the actual armour set themselves, as you can see the symbol on the left hand of their breast has in fact been rubbed off, unlike the other knights of other regions. So we can see here that the Red Main warriors, dutiful to the last, know that they will never return, as they see the battle will never end and they have taken up fire to contain the spread of Scarlet Rot. We do learn from the Red Main pot that fire does seem to hold back Scarlet Rot to a degree, for the description of that pot reads the following. Even today the survivors of Redan's battalion employ fire to stave off the Scarlet Rot. We see this throughout the land as the forces of the Red Main employ fire to prune the infection wherever it is, burning the bodies of infected beasts. But they must also do battle against the resilient and dangerous beasts of Caelid. Right near the entrance to the region, we see that a camp and caravan of Red Main warriors has been completely overrun by these monsters, the flesh of these men now being devoured by the time that we arrive. This is the brutal war against a new ecosystem, one built to erode human life, and from the ruined remains, new dangerous life will be sustained. In retaliation, the Red Main warriors hunt, kill, and burn the mutated beasts of the Caelid Wild. These animals, being able to survive and eat in a land polluted by Scarlet Rot, must be part of its ecosystem somehow, much like the giant ants that we looked at before. And, as even suggested by Zuli the Witch on a Twitter thread, giantism could be a symptom of the Scarlet Rot, explaining the unusual proportion of the crows and dogs in Caelid, as well as the giant ants that also seem to be linked to the Scarlet Rot. 
Regardless, it seems as though the warriors have been at least partially successful in their efforts to isolate the spread of the Scarlet Rock to Caelid. As we can see, the spread of the rock seems to end more or less at the border between Caelid and Limgrave. So how have the Red Mains managed to do this? Well, it simply could be that the rock just hasn't spread that far yet. However, if we look at the environmental storytelling again, we can see that between Caelid and Limgrave, there is a smouldering wall. And it seems that these walls are how the Red Main soldiers have been able to slow the Rot's advance beyond Caelid. Indeed, in general, they seem to use smouldering walls to hold key positions throughout Caelid. Yet the bloom had more consequences than the immediate devastation and destruction of Caelid. It was an act that brought new life in its wake. Melania's Ionian swamp would raise her children, the pests, but it would also birth a more intriguing and complex life form in the form of her Valkyries. In so many ways, these daughters are closer to Melania than anyone else, and so it is to Millicent and her sisters that I would like to turn us to next. Understanding Melania's development can be difficult at times. However, fortunately for us, we can witness someone going through a similar process, one of her blood, Millicent, and having been born from the goddess of rot, she too suffers in an equitable fashion. The cultivation and journey of Millicent is perfectly in balance with what we expect from the Order of Raw. Hers is the story of death and rebirth, her final Valkyrie form being born from the death of the original Millicent. At the beginning of her journey, we find Millicent is basically racked with constant bodily pain and barely functions. As we have previously discussed, it also seems to be that her suffering at the hands of the Raw is the reason that she invades us in the Aeonian Swamp, as anyone that knows her knows this is not in line with her usual behaviour. But what do we truly know about Millicent and her sisters? Well, a good point to start is the Rotten Wing Insignia Talisman, which reads as follows. A talisman depicting a raised prosthetic blade, an honour bestowed upon the Valkyries who serve the Goddess of Rot. The four sisters were born in the Swamp of Aeonia, and came to the Halig tree under the aegis of Gowrie, and yet those buds were doomed never to blossom. So these four sisters, the four that attack Millicent later in her quest, if you choose to assist her, were born of the swamp itself. They are born from Melania's Aeonian rot. They are part of the rot. They are part of Melania that have grown into their owned individuals. Gary describes both Melania and these connected daughters as buds getting ready to bloom. Again, another bit of imagery that talks about rebirth. An idea that he espouses if you give Millicent the prosthetic arm. Afterwards, he says the following. So, you gave Millicent a golden arm replacement. This is a wonderful development. Thank you for your kindness. Now, Millicent may fully realise her true warrior's potential like her beautiful mother. The girl, Millicent, she is a bird, green and undeveloped, waiting to flower into magnificence. What a wondrous day that will be. In truth, before her, I'd never seen a bird of such superior quality. She might very well outshine her sisters. Describing these sisters as buds implies that, like Melania, Millicent and the sisters have the potential, but haven't reached their final form. They are merely buds instead of a beautiful flower, which is the end product of their life cycle. Millicent herself seems to have more potential than her sisters, a bud of superior quality, meaning she has the potential to be a far more powerful Valkyrie when she blooms. The term Valkyrie can give us a hint as to what we can expect from this sort of transformation. In Norse mythology, Valkyries were not gods, but beings who served the god Odin, as winged maidens who would choose who would die in battle. So this is fitting. Melania will rise as a winged goddess of rot, and these daughters, connected to her, transform into her Valkyries, her maidens of rot. It is implied by Gowrie that they are indeed intrinsically linked to her and Melania's transformation, that their ascension will align with Melania's, as he says the following. She is to meet them very soon, her sisters, 
And when she does, she'll be defeated, surely, and begin to flower. Which is why, if you happen to be present for the girl's fight with her sisters, I ask that you side with the sisters and kill Millicent. It must be done by your hand, no other. Millicent trusts you, rather deeply, in fact. Sever that trust. Nurtured by betrayal, her bud will flower most vividly. When Melania ascends to godhood, Millicent too shall be reborn as a scarlet Valkyrie. Like all flowers, they require cultivation. And in this case, it is implied that stress or emotional damage plays a factor in their transformation. Gary implies that Millicent's heartbreak over your betrayal of her will develop her into a more beautiful bud that will sprout into an incredible Aeonian bloom. And it's from this bloom that her new and true form will arise, that of a Valkyrie. Millicent does also seem aware that she has been prepared for a transformation from herself into something else. If you choose to side with her at the end of her quest, she realizes that this transformation would mean the death of who she is now. For she says, But this is where things end. I paused to even tell you, but I took out the needle myself. Tell whoever put you up to this that if I am to flower into something other than myself, I would rather rot into nothingness as I am. In the end, Millicent sees the transformation and rebirth as losing herself becoming something other than she is. And indeed this is true, for if we betray her, she does die, but she blooms, becoming another part of the Scarlet Rot ecosystem, and that innocent girl that we know will be lost forever. By letting her die on her own terms, without betraying her, she just rots away. She dies simply as Millicent, at peace, and breaking the cycle of rebirth. This has some pretty interesting implications for Melania as well. For if Melania is reborn fully into the Goddess of Rot, does her own original self die? This would certainly explain her and Mikla's desperation to prevent this from happening if Melania the Child dies and is replaced by Melania the Goddess of Rot. Millicent's prosthetic makes it pretty black and white that her original form, her original Millicent, will die, but from her carcass, that being an Aeonian bloom, a new being will be reborn from her. As the prosthetic reads, The despair of sweet betrayal transformed Millicent from a mere bud into a magnificent flower, and one day she will be reborn as a beautiful scarlet Valkyrie. And if you do betray her and do choose to kill her, as Gary wants you to, then her body will bloom into an Aeonian flower. She has finally transformed from a bud. The assumption being is that from the remains of her old body, she will one day be reborn as a Scarlet Valkyrie. This is the path that you should choose, if you yourself are a supporter of the Order of Rot. Indeed, I would also argue that another Valkyrie has already achieved this state, as you can find a bloom outside of Melania's boss room, with the Valkyrie Traveller set right next to it. So to surmise, for an Aeonian Valkyrie, this part of Melania, to bloom fully into an ascended form. They must die in the right conditions, birthing in Aeonian bloom, and from this bloom, this carcass of their old body will be a rebirth of a Valkyrie at the moment of Melania's ascension to Godhood herself. In an ironic twist, the Order of Rot needs the unalloyed gold here, something developed to help defeat the Scarlet Rot. The Scarlet Rot writhes now. Worse than ever. Soon, I won't be more than a mound of flesh. So if the rot was allowed to run its natural course in regards to Millicent, then she would eventually have rotted away to nothing. And given that these Valkyries are not the goddess of rot, not the vessel of rot like their mother, they are not made to contain this rot, and so it is so virulent that it would eventually consume them. And so I see Melania's relationship to unalloyed goal is something different than the relationship of Millicent and the unalloyed gold. For Melania, it did truly hold back the rot and stopped her from blooming, 
and essentially halted her ascension to the goddess of rot, whereas the Valkyries aren't purpose-made vessels for the Scarlet Rot, and so they do actually need the intervention of unalloyed gold to actually survive and take their place alongside their goddess, because they have not yet ascended, and they cannot contain the Scarlet Rot within them forever, as we see by the end of Millicent's quest, where she has taken out the needle and is essentially just rotting away by the Scarlet Rot. Yet who is the guiding hand behind Millicent? Who is this man, Gowrie? I think that Gowrie is an important figure in the modern cult or religion of Rot. So now let us turn to Sage Gowrie and the faithful of Rot. Sage Gowrie is fast becoming one of my most favourite characters in the game, as well as one of the most incomprehensible. However, he does give us a few different facts about himself, so let us start there. First of all, he states that he was once a great sage in his day. A sage is essentially a wise man, someone who is venerated for their judgement and experience, and this is backed up by the sage's set, which reads the following. Attire of the wise sages who were deemed heretical, evidence that the wearer was driven from town. In fantasy, sages are also sometimes conflated with mages, and the item description here states that he was driven from a town. Given he is located right next to Celia, I would speculate that he was once a mage that lived in Celia. Indeed, we do get evidence that Gary is familiar with the town and its intimate details, for he reveals the following. As thanks, I vow to impart to you my knowledge of the lost sorceries of the Selians, descendants of the Eternal. So he is extremely well versed in Selian magics as well, as one of the main rewards he provides us with after we help him is the ability to learn secret Selian sorcery. He's also familiar with the secrets of the town, something that surely only a member of that society would be aware of, namely, Number one, Selians are descended from the Eternals. And number two, how one is able to break the seal of Celia. I think this is quite enough to heavily imply that Gary was once a Selian sorcerer, but he was driven from the town for his heretical interest in rot and rot incantations. Of course, he's also able to teach us rot incantations, but there is more to Gary than meets the eye. As I speculate, he is now a rather important figure in the modern cult of Rot, collectively known as the Servants of Rot, as per the descriptions of the Rot incantations. We know such a following exists due to the item known as the Faithful's Canvas Talisman, and the upgraded version of this called Flock's Canvas Talisman, and they both have the same description that reads the following, a talisman bearing an icon that depicts a group of masked figures. The figures represent the flock at prayer, their firm belief in the intangible inspiring even the solitary founder of their religion. While this description seems like a fairly generic description of any religion, both versions of this are found in locations tied to the Order of Rot. The first can be found in Celia Crystal Tunnel, a tunnel system controlled by the Kindred of Rot, and specifically this talisman is found deep within the tunnel network in what appears to be a cult room as it is found at the foot of a stone altar, a site that the pests are using as a place of worship. The upgraded version, the Phlox Talisman, can be found on Gary himself, so firmly linking this talisman to the Cult of Rot. I think the description, while fairly generic, is meant to indicate the existence of a fate related to the Scarlet Rot, something you probably won't even pick up on on your first playthrough given we don't see much tangible evidence of such. However, belief in the rot is here in the lands between. We do see it in the form of the two ghosts we've already mentioned, which surround the Ionian Swamp. The first one is the ghost venerating the swamp as the first site of the bloom, praising Melania on her journey to godhood. For those who believe in rot, this Ionian Swamp must indeed be holy ground, and it makes sense to find cult activity around here. The second is also next to the lake, generally praising Melania's swordcraft and the beauty of the rot itself. Indeed, we find a group of servants of rot near the swamp itself, kneeling as if in holy communion with the swamp. These servants, the servants of rot, are the mushroom enemies we found throughout the game, 
and they are clearly the most devoted to the Order of Ra. For if we read the item description of the mushroom set, the set that they wear, it reads the following. Mushrooms found growing all over the body. These overgrown mushrooms have colonised the torso. To those enraptured by the scarlet raw, these are holy vestments that root one to the earth. So these people are so enraptured by the rot that they have allowed mushrooms to infest and grow from their body. A clear dedication to its power, given how closely linked mushrooms are to the rot, and allowing it to grow from their body is the clearest sign of devotion to its power. And we find these servants of rot throughout the lands between in any place that is touched by poison or by scarlet rot. These are very much beings who want to become one with the scarlet rot wielding raw incantations. They are essentially the priests and the faithful of the scarlet rot faith. Another massive example of rot faith is of course the Shaded Castle in House Moray. We learn from the Moray Mask and the Moray Sword that this line of nobles were Castilians of the castle, meaning that they ruled it on behalf of the powers that be, presumably on behalf of the royal family of the Erdtree. And these items also tell us that they acted as executioners, Elmer of the Briar being one such person clearly sent here to be executed by this house of executioners. In general, I find this to be a very Game of Thrones facet of the game, and it smacks of GRRM's influence. The latest in this line of executioners is Malay Murray, who we can actually fight at a site outside of the castle itself. Malay is the latest Castilian, and it is he who would reduce the castle to what it is now, a stronghold of rot, overrun by the servants of rot, by scarlet rot, a temple to his goddess, Melania. We learn from his robes why he gravitated towards such worship, as it reads, The house of House Marie are all sickly born. Little wonder that Malay Marie would be so beguiled by the beautiful and fierce goddess who is born into Raw. Being a sickly man himself, he is clearly enraptured by Melania, who, whilst also sickly, manages to be one of the most powerful beings in the world, an inspiring god for one such as him, no doubt. Indeed, his cult ideas are certainly more focused around Melania personally, rather than the grand plan of the Order of Rot. And this is backed up by the description of the Valkyrie's prosthetic, an item that we find within the castle, it reads the following. Golden prosthesis, once used by the one-armed Valkyrie, a masterwork of craftsmanship. With practice and skill, it can be used as proficiently as a real arm. When Malay Marie, Lord of the Shaded Castle, embraced this prosthesis, he claimed to feel the presence of his personal goddess. So his worship of Melania is clearly very personal to him, rather than fitting into the general scheme of rot. And this is why he has collected this relic of hers, and why he has a painting of her pride of place in the audience chamber of the castle. It also explains why the castle is overrun with rot, clean rot knights and servants of rot. Malay has given it over to Melania's followers and embraced the way of rot, leading to the castle's collapse under the weight of this decay. So it should now be clear that there are faithful, there are people who believe and serve in the power of rot. And so now let us return to Gowrie himself and the role he plays in this grand scheme. Gowrie tells us of the moment that he became one of the faithful. Since Melania fought Radan, and the great scarlet flower blossomed in Aeonia, I have dedicated myself to her and to the resplendence of the order of rot. The cycle of decay and rebirth. He has been dedicated to this cause since the Battle of Caelid, when the Aeonian flower bloomed. And I would speculate that he was so overwhelmed by this event and the spread of the rot thereafter that he dedicated himself to the rot's cause. Given that he was a resident of Celia, he would have had a first-hand view of the bloom and Melania's battle as Celia sits right next to the edge of the Aeonian swamp itself. I would argue that this is when he would be chased from Celia for harbouring these heretical beliefs, believing in the rot, and when the Valkyries would eventually be born of the swamp, he would be there to act as a father figure for them. 
before guiding them to their mother at the Haley Tree, as we saw described by the Rotten Wing insignia. I would also suggest that Gary is the founding figure of this modern rot faith, the one that's described by the flock and faithful talismans. Firstly, he is in possession of the more powerful version of this talisman, and secondly, he is the only person in the game who really fits this bill. He is wise, powerful, and has an understanding of the rot incantations, and is intimately well versed in the entire history of Scarlet Rot, and he also believes in what it stands for. And indeed, Gowrie's power and intimate knowledge of the rot and its beings can be noticed by those who pay close attention, for we don't actually meet Gowrie in person. If you strike down Gowrie in inverted commas, then that body will collapse and reveal itself to be the body of a kindred of rot, of a pest. And this process can be repeated more than once, showing that he will never truly die because he's not actually there. He is piloting a pest and he taunts us for trying to kill us this way. This shows that he is powerful and intimate enough with the pests that he has been able to control them. And I believe this places him at the top of the pile for potential founders in this religion. Now I know there are those that believe that Gowrie is in fact the outer god of rot possessing pests in order to guide Millicent. And while his identity is ultimately speculation, and I do agree that this is an exciting proposition to suggest, I do not agree with this suggestion. Firstly, as I have shown, I think there's a fair bit of lore that suggests that Gowrie is in fact a Selian sorcerer, shown by the fact he was A, driven out of a town, B, he is very close to said town, and C, he is very familiar with Celia's secrets and their magics. With Gowrie and this religion dealt with, let us turn to the most central figure in all of this. We are returning to Melania, and how she transforms to the goddess of rot. Melania is an unwilling god, someone who has not embraced her nigh divinity, and in fact has worked with her brother her whole life to try and rid herself of this burden. As such, the faithful like Gary, whilst loyal to her and love her, lament her rejection of the rock and her children, the pests. For he says the following. Millicent, my daughter, why would you take out the needle? You were so close, so very close to becoming the fairest of all flowers. Would you disown us too, as your mother did? We children of the Scarlet Rot. So it is clearly and widely accepted that Melania has rejected the gift of the Scarlet Rot and in fact has done everything to deny her ascension. Her own children, the kindred of Rot, the pests, are repeatedly described as abandoned due to the fact their own mother, the one who birthed them in the Ionian swamps, has spurned their kind and the Rot itself, and repeatedly they are known as the abandoned children of the goddess, such as in the incantation Pest Threads. Melania has abandoned this path, and yet whether she chooses it or not, the rot will have its due. She is a vessel for the Scarlet Rot, and there is no changing that. As we have already examined with Millicent, Melania's transformation is linked to the birthing of Aeonian Scarlet Flowers, where she is compared to a bud coming to blossom alongside her Valkyries. And specifically her transformation appears to be linked to her flower blooming three times that advances the rot's hold over her. This is described by the Scarlet Aeonian Incantation, which reads as follows. Each time the scarlet flower blooms, Melania's rot advances. It has bloomed twice already. With the third bloom, she will become a true goddess. The power of the rot within Melania advances every time she unleashes its power in the form of the Aeonian Bloom, her goddess form rising like a butterfly from this cocoon. Butterflies are symbolic of rebirth, and much like Millicent, Melania's final form would come at the cost of her original form, dying. As we've already discussed earlier in the video, it looks as though the unalloyed needle that was once in Millicent's flesh was once in Melania's as well, and it was this that allowed Melania to be her true self and hold back the rock. In Millicent's journey, she seeks to return the pride to her, 
and if you decide to help Millicent, she gives you the needle from her own flesh, hoping you will give it back to Melania so she has her sense of self again. But she dropped and abandoned this needle alongside her pride and sense of self to meet Redan's measure as we find the broken needle at the foot of their battle. And so despite Millicent's wishes to have this needle returned to Melania, it is already too late for any curative measures as we are forced into a confrontation with her that causes her to bloom a further time. And now it's to get to the controversial part of the video that I mentioned earlier on, where I believe we get too carried away with the fact that she is referred to as the goddess of rot in her second phase, as if this is her only and final transformation into the goddess. And I believe that this is only the second time that she has bloomed, and that each time she blooms, her goddess aspect comes out. And I actually believe there's more evidence that argues for this than against it. It's just that we've got used to the narrative that this battle with her is the third time she blooms and is the time she transforms fully. So let's go through the evidence. And the first one is something I've already mentioned, and that is the Aeonian butterflies. As I already discussed in the first video, it's said that these Aeonian butterflies are from the wings of her goddess form, the wings of the goddess of rot. And we see this as true during our fight with her. She opens her wings and they are made of butterflies and Aeonian butterflies spread everywhere. And yet if we are to believe that the third bloom is the only time when she fully transforms into the goddess of rot, how do these butterflies already exist by the time we get to this quote unquote third bloom? The next part I'd like to point out is the semantics we find in the Aeonian Scarlet Incantation itself. It says that the third time she will become a true goddess. Not a goddess, a true goddess, suggesting that she is already a goddess, she just isn't her true and final form. I believe that each time she transforms we do get the aspect of her goddess of rock coming out, it's just that three blooms are required for her to permanently become the goddess of rot proper and bring the world into a new age of rot. The next bit of evidence is I believe we only have evidence of two different blooms. We see one in the Aeonian swamp and that is irrefutable, it's referenced everywhere and we can physically see it. But I don't believe there's been any others since. This is known to be the first Aeonian bloom. The ghost next to the swamp specifically says this is the first instance of this blooming. So that's fine, that's the first bloom. But ever since then she has been comatose, so when's the opportunity for her other blooms? Because if this is the third bloom during her fight with us, she must have bloomed at some other point. Now others will point to the bloom outside of Melania's boss room, and I also owe a retraction here because in my Mikola lore video, I also casually stated that this was most likely the second instance of Melania's bloom, and my opinions have changed since then. So, so I, I apologise for that, but that is something I believed at the time, and I now simply don't believe it. As people pointed out to me in the comments of that very video, this is most likely not Melania's bloom, and it is most likely the bloom of another sister, another Valkyrie. For next to this bloom, we find the Traveller's set, and this is the same set that is worn by Millicent and her sisters. So this isn't Melania's bloom, most likely. And to back this up, the Scarlet Aeonian incantation actually just straight up says she's only bloomed twice. This is an incantation we make after her fight with us. So why would it speak in the past tense when we make it after her? It is suggesting that only twice she has bloomed. Once in the Aeonian swamp, and once in her fight with us. And finally, I just want to return to the true goddess aspect. I do think she is already a goddess of rot. She's referred to as the goddess a number of different sources, especially the ones regarding the kindred of rot, which describe them as the abandoned children of the goddess. I think that she is already a goddess, she's just not the true final form. Consider that rot is all about the cycle of death and rebirth. Does Gary not claim that Millicent will rise as a Valkyrie from her Aeonian bloom that blossomed upon her death? Well, upon Melania's death, we have a similar situation. Another Aeonian flower blooms in place of her carcass, and I believe that one day she will rise again from this bloom, and she will become a true 
goddess of rot. Upon the rotten branches of the halig tree, we find the oracle envoys, who we can learn about from their oracle ashes, which reads as follows. Spirits of a monstrous band of musicians who employ sacred arts. It is said that when oracle envoys appear, playing their pipes, they do so to herald the arrival of a new god, or a new age. And again, I owe another retraction from my Mikla video, in that I stated I believe that they were here for Mikla, but upon reflection, what is patently clear is that they are here for Melania, as despite her efforts, her denial of what she is, her godhood is no longer a choice since removing the needle. It is nigh, and the scarlet rot is advancing and will have its due. Even as she falls to us, I believe that this is not the end, and in fact, as a part of the cycle of death and rebirth, one day the world will need to fear the true god of the Scarlet Rot. So thanks guys, that is my take on the Scarlet Rot and Melania, a really interesting subject and has made Melania one of my favourite and most sympathetic characters. If you have any thoughts about anything I've missed or anything you think I've got wrong, please let me know in the comments below. I love discussing with you guys and as I've said in this video, a lot of your corrections actually help me make better lore videos. If you want to support the channel, please consider giving me a subscribe and a like as it helps out the channel immensely. Uh, as if you like Elden Ring lore and you like it done in depth, that is exclusively essentially what I'm doing at the moment. If you'd like to support the channel in other ways, I have a Patreon, but I also have channel memberships with a few badges and cool little emojis of Gideon. But until next time guys, let me know what you'd like me to cover next, and I will see you on the Wailing Dunes of Caled. Take care.